for coming. My name is Miles. Uh, I'm the founder of SF New Tech. We like to bring people together. We like to share ideas. We like to learn from each other and inspire each other. And tonight is a very special event where we figured let's put together some of the leading women and the leading thinkers in tech that happen to be women and see what kind of magic we can make. And so far, so good. If you had an opportunity to, uh, to smooth and mingle upstairs, hopefully you met somebody new. Hopefully you uh, you got to see some some new technology. I want to give a, a, a big thank you to the companies that uh, demoed with us. I'm just going to pull my list so I don't miss anybody. I want to thank Joel from Motherly. Joel, where are you? Right here. Thank you, Joel. Um, we'd like to thank Bryn from Monday Envelope. Bryn, where are you? Bryn is upstairs closing a deal. Um, Virginia from Mr. Gabriel. Virginia. She's from Super Um, Peggy from Spark Gift. I'm done. Thank you. And Sabrina from the Town Kitchen. Thank you very much. It takes a lot of guts to kind of lay out what you've been doing in front of a lot of people. Um, so thank you for participating. So now is the time where we kind of inch into the formal part of the, the, the evening where we're going to uh, sit down with some, some awesome, awesome people that are, are really, really um, passionate about what they do. And they've uh, accepted to kind of share some of their insights and, and their, their ideas uh, with us all tonight. And they all happen to be women. How cool is that? <laughs> Um, okay, so I'll make uh, quick introductions and then I'm gonna pass the torch uh, of the microphone. Okay, uh, Raji Arasu is the CTO of Step Up and she's gonna be moderating tonight. Thank you, Raji. Uh, Heather Freeland is a VP of a uh, local seller experience over at eBay. And uh, thank you. It's because of Heather that we're all here tonight, so a mixture round of applause. Tina Sharkey from the Sherpa Foundry. Tina's got a long history of making wonderful things happen, so thank you, Tina, for joining us. <laughs> Melinda Brianna Neffler, CEO and founder of Change Catalyst, has a lot of experience in change and diversity, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Edith Young, who I've known for a number of years in town, is doing wonderful things over at 500 Startups in the mobile uh, the, the mobile group about the mobile collective. Um, pushing the envelope like none other, so thank you, Edith. <laughs> and certainly last, last but not least, uh, Jenny Lee from, uh, she's struggling between New York and here. She's the CEO of a company called Plimpton, which is not necessarily a tech company, but they use technology. And she's a, 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 a female founder and CEO of a startup who can uh, share some tears and some insights, I'm sure, of where she is right now. So thank you, Jenny. <laughs> Let's get the conversation started. We're going to have um, a nice discussion, and then we're going to open it up to the room afterwards for Q&A. So just raise your hands high when the time has arrived. You're not? You're not. Hi. You okay? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I um, walked into the room upstairs, and I saw the energy on the floor, and it was awesome. Um, I wish we can actually recreate that every day at um, StubHub, so I would say welcome to StubHub. Uh, this is a casual place where we discuss some really serious stuff, but also fun stuff. So this is, this is, this is the usual hangout, and we get lots of food, and we have fun. So I'm hoping we'll, we'll do kind of the same thing. We'll learn, and we'll have fun. Um, so uh, I just, you know, I'm today very privileged. It's a, it's a privilege to actually be moderating for these fantastic women with very accomplished backgrounds. And I, I'm looking forward to, just like you, learning from I have um, some great questions, and I, I, I anticipate nothing but you know sort of great experiences that you can share with us. Um, just a quick intro for myself: it, it, I'm the CTO for StubHub. I've been here for four years, and I've been at 14 years at eBay. And many of you know StubHub is actually an eBay company, um, and uh, you know a lot of what we do is sports entertainment. Um, and uh, if you haven't used it, just open up the App Store and download our app. <laughs> and, um, and I think one, one of the big greatest part of my job is leading product and technology for such a cool brand. 
and being able to actually roll that out in mobile or desktops and everywhere. So that's that's the cool part of my job. So without that, I will pass on you know the mic. I think you guys have a mic each, and so if you guys don't mind giving an intro, which you do, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Hi. Uh, like Miles introduced me, uh, Miles and I go way back, um, and we're family and friends, so I was really excited to be able to host this event here tonight. Um, but in my professional world, I am a vice president of the local seller experience at eBay, and so my team is responsible for the product experience end-to-end -end for what it takes to sell things on our website and in our marketplace. So if that means selling a beautiful handbag that you no longer need, if that's top that you really loved in the store but never quite fit you right, is still hanging in the closet with the tags, or if you're a big business running a business with hundreds of people working for you in a factory or a warehouse somewhere in the world, we build all the tooling, the infrastructure around how you get that inventory onto eBay and you manage that at scale. Cool. Um, I'm Tina. Um, let's see. Right now, I'm the CEO of Sherpa Foundry and a venture partner of Sherpa Capital. Uh, we work with some of the world's most amazing corporations like eBay and Salesforce and Copy Nest and DreamWorks and others, um, helping them really navigate innovation and thinking about how to incubate new ideas, how to connect with the founder community and how to be embedded in this community and others. Um, I spent the last many decades um, building brands and businesses. I'm co-founder of a company called iVillage. Um, most recently I was the CEO of Baby Center. Um, I spent a bunch of time at AOL running our networks and all of our messaging globally. And, um, and a bunch of other stuff in between. Um, but most importantly, um, you know, New Yorker who moved to San Francisco about nine years ago. Um, love this community and just want to be here to be helpful to anybody who's thinking about building their careers, navigating this industry, or thinking about how to deal with all of the, the ebbs and flows um, of what we all deal with every day. So. Hi, I'm Melinda Epler. I'm the CEO and founder of Change Catalyst. Uh, so Change Catalyst has a few different programs. One, uh, we're working to, we're building an online platform for women change makers. So what we did was we did a bunch, a bunch of research on uh, why women weren't going into accelerator programs and found that there were several reasons. One is that they didn't feel it was a good culture fit. One was they didn't um, feel like going across the country for two to three months at a time was something that they really wanted to do based on uh, they have uh, they have their primary caregivers of their children or and women tend to wait a little bit longer before they go into startups. So we're building an online platform for women change makers, which is an online accelerator for women social entrepreneurs, and then an online uh, fellowship program for women bringing, bringing more women into investing because the numbers are pretty small. Uh, then we also have Tech Inclusion, which is a conference bringing people together across the whole spectrum. Uh, I think this is going in and out, but um, Tech Inclusion is bringing people together across the spectrum of tech to talk about solutions to diversity and inclusion. And uh, we just had a really successful conference about a month ago, and we're going to New York uh, in the spring. So we're really also looking at the whole ecosystem of tech to really shift that. My name is Edith Young, one of the partners at 500 Startups. Um, I don't know if you guys know about 500 Startups. How many of you heard of 500 Startups? Oh, cool. And I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but, but quickly, just in case you don't know, 500 Startups is actually an early stage accelerator, so also early stage investment firm. Um, we're no longer 500 Startups. In fact, we have invested 1,200 Startups uh, in the last five years. Half of the investment that we've done is through the accelerator. So we run about four batches per year, and um, one, one batch in uh, Mountain View, and also we, last year we just set up an office in San Francisco. So every batch is about 700 companies uh, apply, and we take 30 of them, and after they get accepted, we actually sort of lock them up in our space for about four months, and basically bombard them with uh, very simple classes, mentorship, um, and very dedicated resource. We, right now we have about 15 uh, in residence, growth hacker, particular work with all of startup with very strong emphasis on uh, growth and marketing. Um, my name is Jenny Lee. I'm a founder and CEO of the Literary Studio, which is a portfolio, one of those 1,200 companies uh, that 500 startups have invested in. Um, 
it, so we basically work on the edge of digital publishing and trying to figure out how to get it, you know, publishing in the 21st century. This is actually a very good month uh, because we booked $120,000 in revenue, which is very novel, I guess, in San Francisco, worrying about revenue. Um, past life, I was a New York Times reporter and wrote a book. I, in my spare time, I produced documentaries. I have one on Netflix now called The Search for General. So that is. So I can speak. I can speak across tech and media and all kinds of schemes and kind of comparisons. I encourage everyone to Google Jennifer. She had an awesome, awesome uh, video. It's like similar TED talk, but not talk about food. That's <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Please, please watch it. <laughs> Chinese food. That's great. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> so I have a bunch of great questions for this great, you know, amazing panel. And um, we'll get through these, and then we'll open up the floor. So I'm sure your questions are much more interesting. We'll try this. Um, some of you guys have been, are part of public and private groups. And that's amazing. Most many people, I think, in this room sometimes ask for it, or probably already part of some of the boards. It would be fantastic to get some insights into how to get on board. And how does one prepare to get on board? So what are some of the things that you train for? And what are the things you look for to develop as capabilities to get on board? And how much time, roughly, do you need to allocate for doing board duties? Any one of you guys can sort of, you know, and, and maybe you can start with Tina and Jennifer, who I, I know you guys are part of boards. So uh, the four profits, the public, the private, the early stages, I think I'm on one of all of those. Um, so let's start with how do you get on boards? Um, well, I think first and foremost, there's all different kinds of boards. So there's advisory boards. Um, and advisory boards don't have a fiduciary responsibility in the company. Um, those are usually, they're not, they're in public and private settings. And that is where you really are of counsel to either the CEO or senior leaders, depending upon the size and scope of the company. And um, if there's a company that you're passionate about, um, that you're not working at, either that you're investing in or that you're helping, uh, there's nothing wrong with formalizing that relationship and going to the CEO or the leader of that team or that group or whatever and saying, you know, hey, I'd like to be on your advisory board. Um, and they say, we don't have an advisory board. And say, well, why don't we form one? Um, so I think first and foremost, advisory boards are a great place to start because it's not a formal role, it's more of an informal role, and you work with the leadership of the company to actually create a cadence and accountability and engagement, but it doesn't have that formal structure. Um, then I am on the board of early stage companies. Um, so when you're on the board of an early stage company, they don't have a fully fleshed out executive team. So in many cases, in those places, you're actually playing a very fundamental role. Well, this is on the board of directors because you're not only playing the fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the investment, on behalf of the company, but you're probably also kind of mock being a leader in the company, even if it's on a part-time basis because they don't have those people to engage with. Um, and so the question is, how do you get on those boards? Um, well, there's lots of different ways. Usually with early stage companies, like before they've raised their series A, they're probably not putting together big boards. It's not a good idea to have a big board on such a younger company. Having said that, if, you're, if you are an investor in the company, a seed investor or um, an investor through you know, some sort of institutional capital, it is possible, but those boards are younger. Usually more formal boards get established after the Series A, and it depends on how many board seats are set up, but usually at least one of those is for the people who lead that Series A round, and then they have what's called an independent, an independent member of the board. Um, so either you are part of that representative representation because you're representing the Series A investment, either as an investor or as an advisor to the fund that's actually doing that. So sometimes funds, if you're not the primary investor, like the general partner in the fund, um, but you are close to the fund, you might sometimes take a board seat for them. That happens sometimes, especially in younger companies. Then there's also the um, independency. The independency usually comes from somebody in the industry that can add value to help that company grow. So that's, I mean, there's B's and C's and all other kinds of things that happen with companies, but that's sort of the role um, and the opportunities when you're in the earlier stage companies. From a public board perspective, um, that's a whole different ballgame. 
um, a very different responsibility, very different cadence of meetings, and very different fiduciary responsibility because you are you're a public board member, um, and so you're responsible not only to the people on the board and to the organization, but you're responsible to shareholders and stockholders and all of that. And um, usually those are bigger boards, and there's lots of subcommittees on those boards. There's comm committees, there's audit committees, there's um, board recruitment committees, and lots of other things depending upon what that board is. A lot of people feel like you need to have a technical skill or this type of skill, but you should know that in the public setting, if you come from a finance background, but you work in technology, because the people here mostly do, you can be on an audit committee. Like there's lots of different places for people to park their skills in public settings. Um, people who have technical skills can be on those committees. People who have finance skills can be on those committees, and you're part of a larger board. Um, how do you get on those boards? Um, well, actually, I'm part of an advisory group to Sikinder Singh Cassidy. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the work that she's doing. In fact, we just appointed our first board member, Carla Martin. Uh, where we collected a database of women um, that had mentors or sponsors and put in their backgrounds and their information to actually give people access to an entire database of women um, who were available for different levels of boards, whether it's Series A, Series B, public, et cetera. And that just went live, you know, maybe eight weeks ago. Um, and so, yeah, I know, a huge accomplishment. <laughs> Did that um, as a service of the industry to just shut down the conversation that we're all, you know, I guess the notebook of great women, uh, we now have a database of them um, and growing every day. So um, so that's that's one avenue, but those jobs are never posted. So unlike you know Monster or LinkedIn or any of the networks, I think it's very important to build your networks and to ask the question and build a relationship with the CEO. It's a whole nother talk about how do you evaluate which of the right board seats for you to go on, what kind of commitment are you making, how long is that commitment, what should you be signing up for, what should you not be signing up for, what's a conflict to your day job, how do you think about that versus a day job, that's like a whole other offsite we could do. Um, and I don't wanna take all the time or this around that question, but there's a, there's, you know, it's a much longer and deeper conversation, so. Uh, so my experience is mostly in nonprofit boards. Um, I, I actually have no idea how many boards I'm on. It's probably like between five and seven. Uh, so there's, um, I'm on the board of something called the Center for Public Integrity, which is an uh, investigative nonprofit out of DC. And um, on the board also are Craig of Craigslist and Ariana Huffington. Um, I'm also on the board of the Digital Public Library of America. As of July, I think I'm, I was officially appointed, and then like on a bunch of like little uh, little reports at um, the Asian American Writers Workshop and um, Hacks and Hackers, which is a sort of uh, journalism and technology nonprofit. And so, um, uh, if the start if, if, a, if an organization is going well, then um, it doesn't necessarily take a lot of time because everything's sort of running and like the budgets are on time, you know, and like you just kind of. It's like you're like, yay, go like CEO or executive director. When things are not going well, um, it's definitely a lot more interesting, but it can be a massive time suck. And the other, t the other time when it takes a, a, a lot of time is when you're in a search for executive director mode. And anyone who's on that search committee basically is uh, doing that basically half time or full time. Another time when things are not going well is when you know staff and your new uh, CEO are not getting along. So that's also a time suck that we've noticed. Um, and uh, I would say a good board meeting, um, you know, so for the CPI, I, we have quarterly meetings. I'm flying out to DC once every three months. It's a full day um, and you have to also fly there. So that's like a day before and then you get to get back. So I kind of, trying to bunch travel. The, D, the Digital Public Library of America is more phone calls than just one in-person meeting. And a lot of the other uh, things can be done mostly through phone calls. Um, but to the question of like how you get on boards, this one I'm actually a little bit better on because I've been now on the on the um, recruiting side. Like you're like basically they kind of just ask like who should we invite on the board, you know, and your name just kind of comes up and 
you know, and, and it's really interesting because I guess my name in the past has come up partially because I'm like all in one diverse because you get like Asian, you get female, you get young, you get tech, like all in one. Um, and, and so it's actually really funny. On the other on the board, there's also um, a guy named Matt Thompson who is black and gay and young and her. So like together, together we are brought on to like to diversify the all white male boards. Um, it's been done actually a couple times, um, which is funny. And, so oftentimes you get invited because your friends are on it. Um, so I've noticed that, and uh, they can speak to it, and you know it, it helps if you either have money or you have connections. So for a lot of nonprofit boards, you're either giving or getting. Uh, but you know I, I like I generally like the boards. I think they um, they definitely give you a broader kind of uh, perspective on organizations, especially like fundraising and um, how I think that the things that I deeply appreciated is to realize that. Startups are not the only things that are like um, a shit show, right? Like so that you like you can be a very large organization with like a mil millions of dollars budget, but lots of things can go wrong on all different kinds of levels. So that actually made me feel better. I would say that is, that is good. That is. And I think this is fantastic, as you know, Jennifer and Botina uh, pointed out. This is a fantastic time. So if you're a technology and you're in women and you know many other checklists that you need that it's a, it's a great time to actually be on board people are seeking that out sort of diversity and, and once you get on board then it, sort of the network effects happen and then you will have a hard time actually saying no to the next board so this this is great i have a couple things to add too um so when i i was a documentary filmmaker and then moved from that into, <laughs> moved from that into um consulting with with brands um, mostly with social entrepreneurs, social enterprises, and some nonprofits. And uh, during that transition time, I realized I really wanted to get on board. And um, but it was a new space for me. And I think a part of it is just putting yourself out there and letting people know that you want to get on boards. It only took me about. I mean, I'm not saying this this happens for everyone, but it only took me about two weeks of really putting it out there. And then I was invited to two different boards. There are a couple of different um, ways that I did that. Um, when I first started out, the, f the first one that I was asked to, I, I was telling this story earlier today actually, is, is um, the, my very first client um, as a consultant, I asked him to do a LinkedIn recommendation for me and that just solidified in his mind that I was a good person to work with. And then a couple of years later he came back and said, hey, we have an opening on the board, we want you. We need your skills to bring to our board. And so it was It was just, you know, it was that little touch. I, we didn't even talk for two years, and then, and then um, but he just remembered me from that. And the other one was, I was the board on a, uh, a gardening, a, a gardening, um, a, actually a big gar gardening organization. And I started by just working with them as a volunteer, and then, I did that for about six months, and then they asked me to come on board on the board when I was ready. So it, it, it can take just a little bit to putting yourself out there. And then the last thing I would say is that they, it, it's incredible what happens when you're on boards. You see, I was went through a merger as a board member. We're now going through the executive turnover, which is crazy. Um, um, and, and but these are really incredible experiences if you're a startup. Um, looking for, I mean, it, it just gives you this rich experience that you wouldn't get otherwise. Awesome, thank you. I'm going to change the topic a little bit. This is about many of you guys are interested in, in mobile and internet uh, uh, companies. And I say internet, it's the consumer as well as the SaaS based companies. Um, really interested to understand what are some of the evolving trends in the space that is going to radically shift our businesses and, and even our personal sort of lives. What are some of the things that you're seeing? And I know Heather, you're involved very much in the case study. Maybe you can you can provide your perspectives. Um, so when it comes to commerce and mobile, I think it's a really fascinating um, set of trends kind of collapsing and happening all at the same time. Um, the first one is seeing how many of you in the room right now have your phones open and you're using them. Um, the fact that you can now always access this thing in your pocket and sitting out you know, on the table and you're in a meeting and it's buzzing and it's lighting up and it's doing things and it's just constantly grabbing your attention away from what's going on around you. There's an amazing set of moments that you can create to connect people with technology and things happening in a different space and time. And so what do you do with that? How do you utilize that? How do you think about that inspiring you? When you're building up that technology, you're building up that set of capabilities, I think is 
is really powerful. And so frankly, just notifications, I don't know how many you're aware of, like, did you guys all install, how many have iPhones in there? I'm just kind of curious. If you're using iOS, how many have uh, upgraded to iOS 9? So, you know, maybe, I don't know, 30% of the hands or 40% of the hands um, what just went up. What's interesting about that is that iOS 9 had some bugs in it around notifications. And we saw a real impact to um, how people were using our apps and our scenarios as a result of that. Um, and we're just one app, we're just eBay. Like, how many other apps out there were experiencing the same thing as us? And just a simple set of like changes in behaviors and bugs and triggers that Apple was making, some on purpose perhaps, I don't know, I can't explain it. So I think we're probably not on purpose because they quickly fast followed with some follow up uh, uh, dot releases that helped fix them. I think there's a lot to say about that. And so how do you think about designing those scenarios in a way that are um, not invasive, but um, useful and actually additive in value, I think is really important. Um, another trend that I, I tend to see in mobile is just, I'm seeing a bunch of startups doing mobile only work. And I think that's fascinating. It's like some people are betting really hard on like, hey, if we just go native, what is that gonna mean to the way we interact with our customers? And you know, big companies are not there yet, but um, I think there is something to say for somebody taking that risk and saying, I'm just gonna connect with people here. Um, and more and more, I'm seeing myself, even my own behaviors before I go to bed at night, my phone. You know, we all kind of leave it on our, our nightstand. Like this always on access is, um, fascinating and pervasive and frankly a little scary at times too, right? When I wake up in the morning and my phone is like this, like a little bit scary, right? Like probably didn't need to be that close to me. Um, so, you know, I think those are those are all fascinating trends. And then the question is as technologists, what do we choose to do with it? How do we leverage it? How do we build technology that's gonna really connect people with the things they need to know when they need to know them? Um, and again, around commerce, um, at least at eBay, you know, I run the selling team. I'm fascinated with the concept of always being able to um, sell things I don't need anymore and being able to take a quick picture and being able to share that with, you know, a global marketplace of 160 million active buyers worldwide. Um, and that analogy it works in so many different ways. Like the fact that I can share information so instantaneously is very, very, very powerful and connects people in very rich ways. Um, and then finally, there's a social component to it, which I think mobile enables, but it enables it in a faster, richer, more frequent kind of snacking way. This is concept of snacking. Uh, for those of you in tech, you probably are familiar with this term, but the idea is I'm always kind of just consuming little bits of information in between activities during the day. And so I may be online uh, waiting for food, like I was today, um, waiting for my lunch down the block. I may be um, in between meetings. Um, some people like to talk about using their phone in the bathroom. I'm not gonna make any comments about that. But you know, there are moments when you are actually interacting with your phone where you're just kind of trying to fill up little blocks of time, really tiny little blocks of time. And there are ways that you um, can think about how your content is consumed in little blocks of time. And if you can match those things to together in very beautiful ways, I think amazing experiences and amazing connections can happen. And so um, that plus you know, the onslaught of Facebook, you know, seeing how much time people are actually spending engaging in this new version of the wall garden. Like Facebook to me is like kind of like circa 1999 fast forwarded for like AOL. Like for those of you who are around, like back in the day, AOL built this beautiful wall garden of like how people access the outside world of the internet. And I feel like a lot of that is starting to kind of surface within the wall garden of Facebook. And people are using it more and more here. And so there's this fascinating thing, like how do you think about using mobile, but through a social network, whether that's Twitter, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, like how do you think about leveraging those as a way of driving traffic and driving interest and intrigue and connection back with customers who are interested in engaging with you, I think are all really good. Those are trends that get me super excited about the future of this platform. And maybe you can uh, touch on uh, the IoT and the connected devices and that space sort of booming in a different way with data. Um, and I, I'm sure in the 1200 mobile collective fund, uh, you're probably being exposed to some of that. So I have to make a confession, I definitely use my phone while I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> and, uh, and, and also, I am, uh, actually I'm using my Android now, but I have both phones, so I definitely go crazy with my phone right here. Um, I definitely want to touch on IoT, but I want to sort of add on to what you said, what you said earlier. I actually went to a uh, Twitter developer conference earlier today, um, and they just, actually upgraded a platform which is on their platform with nine various different um, SDK, Stripe, and actually empowered by tweets, which I think is very interesting. Um, and I just want to kind of, you know, a few things that you know, I've been tracking, just in general overall. Um, Google actually 
mentioned another thing happening tomorrow also. Um, Google actually just enabled uh, for developing country to allow developer to charge below 99 cents. So I think that's also very interesting because it's more growth. Uh, in fact, the, other than the Bay Area, the world actually have a lot more improvement than iOS. Um, but most of the developers, especially in the Bay Area, start with iOS. Uh, the minute they turn on the Android, um, especially for global audience, um, literally easily five, ten minutes. Um, which is some of the things that I watch quite a bit, like, especially for, for a country like China, Southeast Asia. Um, super fascinating. A uh, couple of things that which I found also very interesting is that you know, we 1,200 companies are not all mobile. Um, there's a lot of companies because I run the mobile fund. They'll say, "Hey, we could be on mobile," but the fact is, you know, <coughs> eBay and stuff have an amazing team and an army of people to actually really understand and operate a mobile business. And if let's say, for, for example, if I come, to, if you come to me and say, "Hey," You know, with um, first off, I don't really believe you if you say, "Oh, my product is so great, I just automatically magically have users." And 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 the first thing I would ask you, being focused on mobile, if that's really the case, then at a really really basic, um, what's your install base? What's your monthly active, daily active? Like, what's the engagement? Like, what's your churn? These these are really some of the basic metrics. If you're running a mobile startup, you really really need to understand. And at the same time, I actually would encourage most of you to start with web, because it's so much easier and cheaper to start. And, and I think that you know, a lot of folks, even in your early stage, it's so easy to buy um, ad on, on Twitter and Facebook. You spend a thousand dollars, you already have fairly good understanding in terms of engagement, how much does it cost to get to quality active users. All right, so quickly to talk about IoT related things. Frankly, we are also, I'm also learning there's so much going on, and I think it's very exciting that you know, IoT, unlike mobile, is not just, I, I still see the phone is going to be the control and sort of the central point to be able to control so many things. But the biggest difference is we, literally, let's say we talk particularly about smart home, every single thing that you can see would have a chip and have sensor and have so much data, and it's all low battery. And, the data part is the thing, the part that is exciting. Um, and for us, for particular 500, we have invested in a little over 30 companies that's smart home related. And frankly, we are also forming our own thesis in terms of, okay, should we focus on device level types? Should we look at more particular consumer use case? Or should, there's a handful, Google, Apple, um, Samsung, Intel, everybody are trying to push their own IoT um, platform. And they all want to be and, and plus Qualcomm, of course. So all these guys are trying to get the developer to build on top of it. And, and so we are sort of you know, dancing around and picking, it's so, so tough to actually pick the right team to invest in, in that sense. Uh, but we usually stay a little bit away from hardware. Um, so that's sort of my viewpoint on IoT. But I do have one area I'm super bullish, is VR. Um, I just made my first VR investment um, a couple of weeks ago. Amazing informal Oculus guys, but virtual I reality. Most, yes, virtual reality, and I think this. So I think it's a fact that 2016 there will be millions of uh, VR devices going to be on the market. Microsoft is all over it. Facebook is all over it, and and I'm super bullish. I think this probably will be a repeat of what's going on with iOS and Android 600 years ago. It's amazing to think that uh, you would be walking into the bedroom and the lights are speaking to each other, saying, "Turn on, she's coming in." Let's turn on the music and the lights, or whatever that might be. This is this is the world we live in. It's quite it's all connected and sensor driven, and uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to imagine how that would be like. Yeah, I just wanted to build on one thing that both of you said um, that in, if you're an entrepreneur and you're thinking about building mobile platforms. You really have to think about the fact that the services industry is completely transformed by your mobile phone. And so when Steve Jobs got on the stage and, and showed the iPhone for the first time, for him it was really a collision of a phone and a music player. He never got on the stage and said, taxi, like that this is going to be how we're going to actually get services. But if you begin to think about, I mean, what's the thing we all want more of? Time. Um, and on demand and things that we just expect just in time, on demand, and services platform. So if your mobile phone is a cursor in the real world, it knows exactly where you are, 
that enables the entire world to build around you and the services that can come around you, whether it is car services. So I thought about the seven mobile car services that I use. Um, now this is a San Francisco high class problem. It's not a problem at all, it's actually a luxury. But we are a petri dish for these new service functions. And so it's such a privilege to live in San Francisco because we get the opportunity to have VCs pay for us to try all of these services. Um, and then we see what we like and then ultimately what scales. Um, uh, but food services, transportation services, um, laundry services, like habituation. And so when I think about that, in many ways, the mobile phone has unlocked more time. And so if a service is what we like to call the atoms and bits collision, so that with your mobile phone, you're bringing something in the real world, this piece of hardware is calling a car, it's calling a chicken, it's calling a valet, it's calling a cleaner, it's calling all of these kinds of things, it's that collision of like the real world and the real stuff and your phone. And if you can do that, you can actually shave off time, uh, which we, begun, we have begun to get used to as thinking we have more time or we're reimagining how we spend our time. And so if you're building products and services in that world, think of some of those, um, those thoughts around this idea that it's a cursor, that it's a services platform, and it's a remote control to call things um, that might exist in the real world into your world. And what does that mean? Because the world is then completely organized around you and your location, your personalization, and the habits that it understands about you. So, so I start off working on Uber for bodyguards. And then they do that when we're there doing them on that two bars. Some glasses. Men in black. Men in black. That's great. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, this is such a fascinating subject, and we could probably take a whole session on this. But I want to move on to one more thing, which is you guys represent, and you're, you're representing a ton of you know, founders and investing in startups. CEOs of company, um, and uh, that has different dynamics. Uh, there is different kind of work dynamics and leadership dynamics that exist. As you interact with a lot of executives, board members, and, and a lot of the management team, I just would love to hear a little bit of uh, insight into how you deal with it. And specifically, I think, Jennifer, Tina, you guys have this other dynamics coming in from New York or to Silicon Valley, and you see some of that in the leadership a very much tech leadership kind of uh, dynamic, and there's a lot of thought that happens in the workplace, which is slightly different from the, the New York kind of background. So I would love to hear some of that, and then you can mention as well. I would love to see you guys. Um, okay, so yes, I'm a New Yorker. Um, but I think that the impact, yes, badass. Um, but I would say that the truth is that it's not so much San Francisco versus New York. I think it's very much the fact that um, it's BYOD, everyone's bringing their own devices to work. Um, that the workplace is completely populated now with millennials. That millennials have not necessarily gone through the same kind of experience sets that people with more tenured leadership have. And it's not so much an East Coast, West Coast thing, it's that merging of cultures and attitudes and um, sort of patina and having been, I've been down that road before, you haven't been down that road before. So um, it's thinking about mentorship and thinking about buddy systems and thinking about how can like, for me, when somebody asks me if I'll mentor them, um, my first question is what can I learn from you? Like it has to be bilateral. Like if you wanna get something from me, what can I learn from you? And so I think in this environment as a leader, um, when you're working with all kinds of multi and interdisciplinary skills, thinking about how can you learn from somebody else, and then what do you have to share and teach and give? Um, this is a world of complete transparency. It's the first workforce that's ever worked in complete um, social media, so this is a workforce that works in public. So everything that you say is in public, and so it changes the dynamics of the room, it changes the dynamics of the conversation. Um, and so the authenticity of that conversation and the transparency and the engagement and the fact that it's bilateral learning uh, is really, really important piece. So I don't think it's so much about New York versus San Francisco. I actually think it's about you know, multi-generational workforce um, that is enabled with tools that they're bringing themselves. And so, and presence and multitasking and how to be present and really listen 
um, and be aware and thinking about that is all really important. I don't know if that answers your question. So you have two different questions, I'll answer them in two uh, pieces. So one, I'm also a New Yorker, still in denial about living here. I still have my nine month seminary code. I vote in New York, I pay uh, and something else. Oh, I, um, I pay, well, I pay my taxes here, but I'm one day I'm still going, oh, huh? No car. That's 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 how you're. That's how I'm in New York. I can survive completely through Uber, Caltrain, and uh, Zipcar. So the, the most interesting thing, actually, so less about the culture in terms of like East Coast, West Coast, just sort of like Bay Area, like not Bay Area. Um, one of the most interesting things coming from a media background is the Bay Area is a culture that has a hard time knowing how to value something if it cannot be measured in numbers with lots of zeros. Or like it's it's actually really conceptually hard. Uh, for people, so that's really you know interesting. If you come from a world you know where you know film and art and like you know these these things uh, that are also very valuable. And I think Albert Einstein had a very good quote, which is not everything which can be measured counts, and not which every not everything which counts can be measured. And so the one exception which has been really interesting is the world of VR, because it is it, like historically the Bay Area thinks of content as a commodity, like everything is great and equal. You have YouTube, every, you know like everything go up, uh, you know, Twitter, sort of, these things are like basically platform plays. And for the first time, and I see this in film, and I see this in um, in sort of like a journalism kind of context, the technology or something like, oh wait, we need the storytellers to help us because otherwise we won't, like, we won't be able to sort of get people to adopt this like cool technology we're developing. And, um, you know, so, Oculus came full force last year at Sundance, which is very unusual. You do not usually see that at all. So that's my, my one point. And the other point about sort of like female leadership, and I, you know, sometimes every so often I do, you know, some of these are like, you know, female startup CEO type of panels. And the point, I forget what the question was asked me last time, but basically the answer was, um, I have authority because I control the money, right? Either I bring in the money either through sales or I bring the money in through investors, because like my skill is like, getting money from those who have it and like kind of giving it to those who don't, whether or not through a context of like non nonprofit or a startup. So I think, I mean, if I think about it, I guess it, you know, I probably work on a monthly basis with about 20 people, 18 of them are male maybe, I think, and uh, but they kind of listen to what I say because at the end of the day, like I decide whether or not they get paid, right? And so that's a very different, <laughs> very different dynamic, I think, than compared to um, a lot of other situations. And then um, that is, if you control the budget, like if you don't control budget, you don't really have power. That's like you might have influence, but you don't have power. I was, I was gonna answer the question a little bit differently because I, I really focus on the leadership component and as a startup CEO, you, you wear 10 billion different hats and you're a leader and um, you're the CEO, the COO, the CFO, the everything, um, all at once. But then on top of doing all of those things as an entrepreneur, uh, as a female entrepreneur, there's also another level of leadership in being a role model to others, and you touched on it a little bit around uh, mentorship, but I think there's another level too of uh, telling your story and um, being a part of that story that gets people to understand the importance and the power of women leaders, if that makes sense. Like, you're, you're all of a sudden you're a part of a, another layer that of responsibility. Um, it's just something to kind of uh, that I just now was starting to think about that there's these multiple layers and and there is that responsibility that we have I think as women leaders in this space because there are so few of us <clears throat> there are so few of us that um, we we have to lift each other up we have to sponsor each other and we have to mentor each other and and then in the way where where you have the pawn um, this is a this is a topic that if you don't address and talk about probably is, is a panel um, you lead something which is very, very um, crucial, which is a diversity and sort of like helping women leaders. Some of us are coming back from Grace Hopper uh, conference, and we've been to the conference, and there's a, there's a lot of awareness that's being generated, and large corporations that are pushing for women leaders and women in the workforce. Um, but this is probably something we have put very on. Like, we have had percentages which are still very low in, in, in single digits and in double digits in some other companies. and so what is it going to take to fix this or address this problem? What is it? What do you expect the women in this room or otherwise to? What is 
they would make this as well. Yeah, it was, it's pretty ironic that we are the center of global innovation here, but yet we can't seem to innovate ourselves into a more inclusive environment. And I think part of it is just that we, we don't really try that hard yet. <laughs> I think as a group, we all need to be doing it. We all need, we all have a role to play in that. And we haven't really taken our innovation lens and really put it on, okay, how do we really fix the problem of diversity and inclusion? I mean, it's not something that you can just fix overnight. It's something that we actually need to look at the systemic level and we need to, um, both from the top down and the bottom up and everybody in between, we all need to be working on it together. And Heather, I know you've been doing a ton of work on the subject at uh, Bay, so just wanted to find out if anything's working. <laughs> um, I actually think it has been working, and probably some of the stuff that you based on that I've really appreciated being part of is um, we've created an organization. We have women in technology organizations. A lot of it is just kind of very organic. We have female engineering leads who like to kind of drive events and drive attention and drive momentum around that. And so we've got a ton of mentoring and a ton of networking that happens within the company to help elevate, teach, and train. But at the same time, um, our senior leadership recognized this issue about know, five or six years ago when I first started at eBay and started creating um, a, like a very senior level uh, women's conference every year for all the leaders. This is what as part of PayPal. So we'd have you know, 500 women leaders in the room of a very, very senior level within the company coming together to learn, teach, and train. We bring in like the world's best experts. And so Stanford actually has a program um, that has done tremendous research to fast forward the thinking and to really understand gender differences in the workplace. We brought them in to teach and train. Um, and I think knowing and learning and understanding gender differences, frankly, is half the battle. Um, but the second they showed this at the women's conference, all the women leaders stood up and were like, hey, can you go teach this to the men? Like, next thing you told us, like, we get to their differences. Can you go tell those guys? Because those are the guys who work with them, okay? We want them to understand this, too, because it's going to take both sides to acknowledge and understand um, how to work better together in order to kind of advance this. And I think, you know, our leadership team um, has been very, very proactive and very um, attentive to this issue. Um, in addition, we've asked like all VPs in the company to adopt and have like a certain set of mentors within their um, belt. And under that, if there's a certain number of diverse um, candidates that we want them, that we want to make sure get mentored. And so again, like a combination of HR best practices and frankly, like a lot of this was our senior leadership team which I thought about really being very attentive to figuring out what it was going to take to crack the uh, to crack this one. And we've made a lot of progress. I mean, frankly, so just today I actually had an hour long mentorship session with one of the women I mentor personally. And this is something I do both professionally in my day job and also just personally because I get a lot of practice. I've actually spoken to the conference. It's a great conference. Um, I think one of the, the really um, unspoken things, I'm a single working mom. I have a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old. Um, and um, I think that people don't talk enough about what's going on at home. Um, you can lean in, you can sit on the table, you can dance on the table. But at the end of the day, if like, there are kids waiting for you at home, um, you want to put food on the table and you want to have dinner with them. Um, and so I think that in the same way I talked about transparency, I mean, I remember, you know, 10 years ago, no one would have posted photos of the first day of school. It was just sort of interesting how everyone was <coughs> sick those days. Um, and we've actually made tremendous progress that parents, uh, dads and moms can post the first day of school photos and actually come in late that day because it's a milestone that matters in their families' lives. And by having that transparency, it creates tolerancy within the organization where you can actually talk about it. Having said that, it goes way beyond the first day of school photos and getting on the bus for the first time. It's actually about childcare and daycare. Um, and having a good partner um, who can have your back. And um, you know, one of the most important things I think Sean wrote about um, in Lean In was getting to 50-50. And this idea of how you choose your partner. And Amanda Bradford, I don't know if you've heard of the league, it's a, a, a mobile uh, dating app, but she's a tremendous founder that I mentor. And she posted a piece yesterday that if you haven't seen, you should totally read. And it's really about this idea of her vision for the league was not about building dating, but it's helping people find real partners who can really get them through the, the milestones in their lives ahead. And so we don't have to hide the fact that you know our kids are sick or there's a school conference or you know at the end of the day like 
your mom, your dad, like you have a real life and it's your whole life. And I think that as much as you can mentor in the workplace and put people on a diversified slate and mentor them into leadership roles and do all those things which are awesome, really understanding what's going on in someone's whole life and how you can support that is going to be the tipping point to actually keeping women in the workforce. Um, and that is the, the most important underlying issue because you look at the ages that women check out, it's the internal ages because they're being pulled between two masters um, and they shouldn't have to choose. We had an event last night and that was one of the main things that came up was childcare. But I also want to address the, it's, it's that age, that age is also the time when leader, when people want to become leaders. And I think there's this other level, because I actually, so I don't have kids. And one of the reasons I don't have kids, which I've actually never said in public before, is, is because I never felt like I could and be where I am today and really create the changes that I wanted to make. Um, Having said that, I still have gone through a number of biases and discrimination and really felt uncomfortable in my workplace. And and that it, there's another level on top of that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. There, um, but I also think that there's this other unspoken uh, level of promotion that, um, that is a big part of the problem. And then there are the biases around that promotion and, and what happens when you actually get past that promotion and there's this glass cliff that people talk about. Does, it, does everybody know what that is? So um, we talk about a glass ceiling and that's kind of like you can't get past the mid-level um, into the executive level. There are people like me that have gone up to the executive level and once you get there, it is the most miserable experience that you've ever had, and you jump off a cliff, and you go out of the industry, and that, that's what happens. So I was a, a I was a um, an executive in an engineering firm, and um, I, it was one of the worst experiences of my career. Uh, I have I was a documentary filmmaker, then I was a consultant, and um, and I've been able to kind of really work about work quickly into each new um, job and do really well. And this was the one and only time where I wasn't able to do that. And about six months in, I realized, okay, I'm leaning in, I'm, <laughs> I'm stepping in, I'm jumping in, and, and nothing is really happening. And it's all the little biases that, that every day I was the only woman in the room. Every day, uh, there weren't minorities, it was all white men and me. And, um, when that happens and a culture is not ready for you to sit at that table, it's every day there's these, these the death by a thousand paper cuts is what the White House, C Megan Smith, the White House CTO talks about, is just every day you run, run up against wall after wall after wall of people who aren't receiving you, who aren't allowing you to speak, who aren't inviting you to speak. And that's... What would you do if you had a second chance at it? I mean, did the getting off a cliff wasn't an option. So what would, what would you do in that situation? I, it was an option. I, I, don't, I actually don't, I, I, did, I, I did work to change the, the culture, but that's one of those things, it's, it takes time. So what I, I did, um, I was in a fortunate position of being in the C-suite, so I was able to, to help change that culture and put some people into place and some programs into place to move that culture over time. But it takes five, seven years to really move a company around and so I that's not why I'm put on this earth. Um, I was put on this earth I think to be there to see it and to start the change process and then to move forward and really look at this bigger ecosystem and work to change that. So, um, I want to quickly I completely agree and understand that there's a lot of you know scenario and things happen particularly bigger companies and I think one of the things I do want to emphasize, particularly when I talk to women entrepreneurs who's pitching for money, and one thing that, as much as there are a lot of situations that happens, and you know, I think one of the things, at least how I like to address it, so I spent 10 years mostly in enterprise software, six years with, with Siebel, and then Oracle, and then all of that. Um, very, very fortunate, most of these companies actually treat women professionals fairly nicely. But when, whenever things like that happen, um, I think most most women 
like, I don't know about you guys, but I like to, if I see something that I don't feel quite right, I don't usually speak up, so that's number one. Second thing is that I think women like to, we're all multitask, we can do a lot of things. So you, if you see something wrong, you like to just sort of fix it or just do it. Um, and that happened in the, house, in the household and at work quite a bit. And I think that a lot of the entrepreneurs that, who are men, they're, they're really good at is like, like really bad at it. Able to admit that what you're good at or not good at. Um, so a couple of things I want to at least, you know, there are actually women entrepreneurs that came to us because we actually run a women's syndicate uh, particularly focus on investing in women, so we are very supportive of it. But literally, there, there are women founders who came to us and say, I'm a woman, I need to get funding because it will be very tough for us. That is not the reason how you would be able to get funding. In fact, it's to, as much as, yeah, there are glass ceiling or the cliffs. <coughs> I think the biggest thing we all need to help each other out is to be a better, is even more amazing professionals and learn the different communication set of what, why, why that guy get that and not me? And there are certain things that, traits, that investor, regardless of men and women, look for in that founders. And know your numbers, know your stuff, know your competitor, know the whole environment. And I am very proudly invested in two women, definitely a minority, I invested in two women founders. They are amazing. Some of the best CEOs that I've invested, much better than them, all the dudes. Yeah. Um, but, but, but they are individual because they are amazing, not because they are women, right? And we all need to be, a, we're amazing founders and professionals, and that's what we should do. Thank you. I, I, I also want to give an opportunity for the audience here. I'm sure, uh, you know, there's a lot of people the time. So why don't we open that up, because I'm sure there'll be uh, a <coughs> We have another half hour or so. Hi, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, so my first, aspect, my first kind of point was um, to actually what you just said, which is I love these events. I go to a lot of women in tech events in San Francisco and New York and wherever I am. But um, one of my issues with them is exactly that. If we look around and the percentage of women versus men here tonight is overwhelmingly women and it's about the individual, it's about what skills you bring to the table. So I would love to hear anyone's thoughts on how we can actually, you know, maybe it's renamed to its events, maybe it's marketed women differently rather than women in tech, maybe it's gender equality and terms like that. Um, uh, so that's my one point. My, my other point was um, actually when you were talking about um, so, uh, when you're talking about uh, women talking about their own um, childcare and their lives and their families and all, how do we bring that balance between the, stere the, the um, stereotypes or the um, discrimination that does exist between that and women? I was at a Women in Tech Breakfast recently and one of the speakers on the panel said that you know when men in the workplace put on their calendar swim lessons with their kids, it's a very different uh, thought that goes into people's minds than when women say, I'm taking my kids to swim lessons. When men say, I'm taking my kids to swim lessons, it's like, oh, well done, what a great parent. When women say that, it's a very different connotation. Right on. So, how about these parenthood? So, how, how do women, um, whether you're a leader or whether you're just, you know, not, not a leader or not a manager yet, how do you strike that balance? bringing your your personal family life into into the workplace and also um, with the discrimination that does exist in people's minds. Yeah, I, I just want to address the first question a little bit in, in terms of bringing allies into the discussion. And what, one of the things I think it's, I mean, I. I think it's incredibly important to bring allies into the discussion and to make this a safe space for them to, um, to listen. I also think that it's incredibly powerful to bring women together and to help each other and support each other. And so I think there's a place actually for both of those discussions to happen and to really allow that kind of a conversation that hasn't really happened in the past to happen here. 
So I'm really lucky. Um, my partner is a man who is a 50-50 parent. Um, and this has always been our relationship. And perhaps we were just a little bit before our time. Um, so I'll call him a renaissance man. Um, but it's really hard, actually, sometimes. Um, I'll just give you the example. Like tonight, I'm here. And he's taking care of the various activities that my children have. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And they are busy people. Um, and the only reason why I can do things like this is because we split our time. Like we make sure we cover when each other needs it. During the day, you should see what our text messages look like. It's almost amusing. Like, what time are you gonna be home? What time are you gonna be home? I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Like we're constantly like project managing our family's lives together and it requires quite a bit of effort. Um, and frankly, sometimes can be a little bit contentious when you have conflicts, right? And how do you work those out? How do you make sure your children are cared for and they're safe and they're happy and they're successful? Because at the end of the day, that's a legacy we live in the world. Um, I will say he works in, in finance, and that's a field that sometimes is difficult. Like, most of his peers do not have wives at work, um, and not only do they not work, um, you know, they haven't worked for a really long time, and so for his peers, this isn't something that they grapple with, and so I think for him, if he was here, and I'd love actually to get a panel where we had kind of both voices represented, um, I think you'd hear a different tone. Like, he works pretty hard at supporting me um, at the things I need to do in this world. And I'm just very, very, very appreciative of the sacrifices he makes to make that all go around for both of us and for our families. And I want to believe that my children are better off seeing that kind of balanced parenting um, as a result. Um, that's the way our families run. I don't know if it's good or bad, honestly. Like I could tell you in 20 years how it all comes out. Um, I will tell you along the way, there are definite challenges there and it's not always uh, unicorns and rainbows. But I do think it's worth it. And I think it's, a, it's constantly something we're both working at. Um, and I just appreciate that he's very open-minded to it and has always been an amazing partner to me. And this has worked out well for us. Um, but you know, it requires ongoing work. Like that, that's not something that you solve once and you kind of file it away and you move on. It's an ongoing thing where you lean in and people have different you know, ebbs and flows of their work and their personal lives and things they're trying to accomplish. And I'm just happy that we're both grounded about what our priorities are. And it's not just about work. It's about our family and then other things that fall in line behind it. But that's something we're constantly balancing. There's one, there's one point that you made that, uh, you know, I don't think it's fair for um, people who do not have children in the workplace to have to carry the burden for the people who do have children in the workplace. And I think there's that reverse discrimination that goes on as well. And it's just important to be mindful of that. That's why I talked initially about transparency, like setting expectations for what you can do and what you can't do. Just because I'm a working mom and might have to leave for this, that, or the other thing, or come in late for this, that, or the other thing, it's not my expectation that uh, somebody's gonna carry, do my job for me. Um, it means that you know I'm gonna get up earlier and do something, and then I'm gonna do it to take care of my family thing and then go to work, or I'm gonna go home, have dinner with my kids, and then go back to work, if that's what I'm signing up for. And I just think working with your team so that the person who's there, just because they don't have a kid and don't have to go to parent-teacher conferences and all the other things, doesn't mean they should have to do your workload for you. But I think having that conversation, because I think sometimes it's reverse discrimination that happens, and the people who don't have kids in the workplace end up carrying the water for those who do, and that's not fair either. So I think it's about transparency, collaboration, communication, and setting expectations so people understand what you can sign up for and what you can't sign up for. One last thing, and I promise I'll stop on this topic, give you more questions. I'm passionate and happy to chat with you after. Um, I will say I talk all the time about the balance I'm doing in my workplace um, with my job and my personal life. So when I did parent-teacher conferences last week, I was very clear about it. I booked it out weeks in advance. It was on my calendar. My admin helped me schedule things around that. And I told people, like, without an excuse, I'm like, I'm going to the parent-teacher conference today. I will happily talk to you on the way there. I'll happily talk to you on the way home. I can't attend that meeting, and that's going to be OK. It's taken me a long time to feel confident enough to be open about that. And I will just tell you all that openly. There was a time when I was breastfeeding and then I was back at work and I had to figure out how to pump in between meetings. That was a really, really hard time for me. Um, trying to like sneak away for 20 or 30 minute intervals was really, really challenging. And so I'd say, you know, five, six years ago, I wasn't as transparent about it. I wish I was. Like my lesson I learned now is that people aren't judging. They honestly don't care. They just want to know when you can commit to being present so they can get their work done. And they want to know that they can do it at such and such time. And if you commit, they're fine. And so it's more about you guys and all of us being more comfortable about saying that and just being transparent about it. And the rest, I think, will actually flow for you from that. But I think that's OK. We need to all be OK with having those discussions. Yes, hi. 
Um, so I was actually a place hopper as well, and I saw Shel Sandberg talk about this sort of partnership. She also talked about that with her late husband. And um, I think it's really interesting. Um, I worked in a corporate job up front of this, but I, I'm starting a nonprofit specifically addressing these issues. And, and um, there was an article in the Atlantic um, called The Rising Egalitarian Movement, which is we have partners um, who support us and then help us with you know, as individuals help us with the family unit, but then we don't yet have in America the societal constructs to actually do this on a scalable basis. And we're all in tech. We all think about things in scalable ways. And have you seen any really like proof and concept of scalable societal constructs that would help us take like what we experience successfully as in, as individual units, parents with our partners? And then maybe perhaps replicate it on an organizational level and then maybe even a national level. Um, I think it's Yeah, I think um, 
in most of the STEM fields, actually, there are more women, increasing, increasingly more women coming out of most of the STEM fields, except for computer science, where it peaked in the 80s, and now it's, and it's, it's this horrible graph where it goes up into the 80s, and it goes whoosh, down. Um, there's no easy answer to why that's happening. I think it's a number of things. It, it goes from the culture fit that um, you know women are seeing so many other women leave tech, right? Um, and then also, I, I think there's some some biases that we're not addressing in the education system as well. You know, we we have we have we have unconscious bias training in our workplaces that are starting. We also need to be starting to do that in the education systems as well. And it was very interesting because one of the University of Wyoming did a study where 50% of their STEM women never made it into the workforce. And then there was a huge percentage that actually dropped off like in the next few years. And they basically had every single person in the room responsible. We had about 55 large companies in there, like you know, the key members in each of these companies. Um, and they said, you know, they shared the comments. They shared comments from these women as they're leaving the workforce or they are, you know, they are feeling like they, they can't do it. It's, it's mostly, a lot of that is, what is manager for them, believe it or not. I mean, it's still the re main reason why people leave work, you know, because they don't get the support. And in half the time, it's, it's just that sort of, that, that, uh, the, the environment that they're in, which doesn't seem to be supportive, does not validate, um, and does not coach. So those are the three things that sort of came up is, is Really, they needed more value. They needed to be coached. They needed that one level of support that they can get from them. And these are young women, very, very sort of um, aspirational in terms of where they wanted to reach. And they actually left it and, and either went into business or other areas. It was a very interesting study, and they didn't. They took away the company names and shared the survey. It was very depressing. It was very depressing to actually see that. And I think so, one of the questions that Grace Hopper asked is, you guys all come here and you spend so much energy in trying to actually improve women, and then you don't take care of them. <laughs> so, you know, that, that doesn't really feed this. And so how do you, how do you really become um, different, and how do you really live the brand to take care of this, um, uh, this workforce? And that's a key part. And I, I also think that there's another part of all of us in this room that we need to play a role model is to get out to schools and talk to the young women and have them join the STEM STEM classes. I'm part of an advisory for Code.org, and it does a lot in teaching, you know, getting coding into schools. But but I think that it's more than that. They need to see role models. They need to see role models go into school, talk about what code is for work in your company, in the workforce, and they have to see that. They have to see you with passion and sort of that, that dedication. So that more people will actually take the first step into the workforce. So it's, it's very insightful, and I don't know if you, you got any information. There was no minority versus you know um, others. Like I think it was it was just pretty much gender based study that they've done. And um, and I know I can't count on minorities, but I think it was very very much like, insightful into what's happening. There's a great organization called Girls Who Code. I don't know if any of you in the room are familiar with it. They're phenomenal. Um, and we hosted the last two summers groups um, from Girls Who Code to basically sit in eBay spaces all summer and spend summer camp learning to code at eBay um, with real world problems that they were building technology around to solve. Um, I really get so excited meeting with these women both years. Um, I was involved with the program. And part of what gets me excited about it is they're in an atmosphere where coding is cool. We're actually working on technology is cool and welcome, and they're surrounded by other people doing the same thing. And I think there is definitely a huge cultural piece to this. I think that's what you said before, but um, we need to make like working on technology problems like part of the accepted part of society in America. And I don't think we're quite there yet. Is my guess. I mean, I'm way many years past my schooling, but you know, I can tell you for sure. Like when I was um, in my undergrad degree. I don't have an engineering background, and one of the reasons why was probably somewhat related to this. I was off the charts in math and science. So, um, and still to this day, I'm very excited and ignited by technology, but I'm, for the most part, like self-taught and taught on the job. Um, and I think that's a missed opportunity for me um, as an individual, and I, I would like to see more programs that, that make 
coding fun, that make technology cool, that make it seem like it's something that everybody does. And the more we can build it into the curriculum way early on, the more people will just kind of grow up with it and they won't think about it as a gender or you know, um, a hip or cool thing that certain kinds of people do and other people don't do. Um, and I think right now in America, there probably is still some stereotypes left around that in our culture is my guess. <coughs> I'm Connie Brandon, and I've been doing web design and development for 20 years now. And before that, I was in cable TV. So my question is about the um, large number of solopreneurs and freelancers we have in this country. It's a whole job level of employment that isn't being addressed here particularly. We talk about female entrepreneurs, but a lot of those female entrepreneurs are actually solopreneurs and are not going to be supported by the organization change that you're discussing. And then to top that off, there's an aging population such as myself. I went through tech, had my son, went through all uh, issues that your guys are talking about. But you know, I'm still, I hasn't changed yet. Um, and my mother started the first daycare union in Chicago way back when. So um, all of these issues have been around for a very long time. But we also have an aging workforce of women who still want to work. I'm not done yet. So I just, if you could address any of those issues. That was several issues. Um, um, there is definitely a, a problem with age discrimination in Silicon Valley. Without, I mean, absolutely. I, I have, um, I worked with an executive coach for a little while, and she's like, please start a company where um, a bunch of 50 year old women can come and all work together because there's just all of these powerful women out there that have these amazing skills and, um, and have been in the space for a long time, but they are seen as irrelevant. And um, it, it does happen, I think, more with women than, than men, too. So there's that extra level for, for women, unfortunately. There's very little, uh, I, I have not seen very many organizations out there to start to really address that. Um, I think it's, a, we need to have more conversations like this where we're bringing that into the conversation. I think also, there's a lot of intersectionality conversations that we should be having around age, around disability, um, because there are women with disabilities as well that should be part of the conversation. Then there are um, you know, women who have, uh, who are of different racial backgrounds as well. And once you add another component to that, so it's the intersectionality between two different um, underrepresented groups, it makes it 10 times harder to have a job. And I, I don't have a good answer for that, except that I think we need to bring that more into the diversity discussions. The second, the first question was? Solopreneurs. Solopreneurs, yes. I personally believe that sometimes, that there's a, population of women solopreneurs that are solopreneurs by necessity, that if they had the resources, um, if they had the ability to grow and their businesses, they would, but their resources aren't out there. And so I'm actually working particularly hard to bring those women into the fold of, of the resources that we're building so that we can really um, support women that do want to grow and scale their companies. I think there's a lot of women that um, in the same way that we have the confidence gap in the in the corporate workforce, I think we have a confidence gap in the uh, entrepreneurship space too. We have one question. Um, you, you want to ask this question? Um, so, so we're all uh, largely distributed. So we have you know a core group of people that work full time, but then we have we work with a lot of. Um, uh, writers and editors and designers and what's really interesting is I just did I just did this big call for like you um, recovering classics fellows and it was they applied online uh, you know everything is over email um, a bunch of Stanford kids applied and and then I went down actually on Thursday to meet them so they, they basically like, you know they signed up and said do you want to try to do this task which is lay out a ebook um, in beautiful and just watching that, you know, I can just judge on their competency. And it's also really interesting because one thing is that coming as a journalist, it's one of the few, few fields where the quality of your work can be boiled down to eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper, right? Like a little bit of rounding error because like who did your editing, but there, there literally is something that, that shows the quality of your work. 
And um, when I interviewed, when I sort of met these kids in Purdue, because I was down in Stanford, um, I realized it was a very good thing to have actually have them do all of their all of their work blind because they're like generally um, pretty socially awkward. I mean, because they're like nerdy, you know, like some of them are computer science people who like books or whatever, and they didn't like necessarily interview well. But I could see I had already seen the quality of their work, so I didn't judge. So I wonder, you know, with a combination of like Slack and email and uh, you know, people applying and then a testing kind of mode where you can just see all of their work done remotely, if that actually works in the favor of people who might not kind of be as um, uh, classically like white male-ish, like, you know, what, whatever kind of biases that we sort of um, assign to the way that people look, looked at. And I also work with a company called Upworthy. I was part of the launch team there and also that was almost entirely remote, right? And I probably hired like a third of the first like 20 people. And what, that was also something where you could test and uh, do everything sort of um, remotely. And one of the arguments that people had for the strength of that culture, and there's some you know, disadvantages of actually not physically being in, in the same place. There are some strengths. So one is that you can't get mad at each other for like who left the dishes in the you know kitchen sink, and then the other one is like you 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 don't discriminate on age, you don't necessarily discriminate on uh, how someone looks because at the end of the day you have the quality of work just in front of you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. I appreciate it, and I'm I'm listening intently uh, this past half hour when we had the audience questions. And one thing that concerns me is that I grew up in New York. I was born and raised in New York, and I went to a school where I did science research, particularly in uh, blood seed pattern analysis, for three years. I was an Intel semi finalist for my research. I went on to MIT. I didn't notice the gender discrimination until I got out and came to the Valley. And that concerns me because I'm tired of coming to events where all we talk about is all the issues that women have in tech. If I were 18 and I were thinking about where I want to go in MIT or what I want to study, I wouldn't choose tech because all I do is hear complaining, complaining, complaining. These are the issues, these are, these are the issues. And this is no disrespect to anybody on stage today. But rather than talk about what's wrong, let's talk about what we did to do right. I want to hear about the things that, for example, like what weaknesses you have that you facilitated through what tools? How did you become a better manager? How did you lead your team? I lead a team of five male engineers and designers, and I don't care. I don't care that they're men. I care that they get their work done. And I want to come to events where I'm learning how to do my job better rather than hearing about how hard it is to be a woman in this world. Like, I know it's hard. I have my period every month. I get it. <laughs> I really want to learn from women. I want to be a, a, better, a better leader. And I say that because I have this advisor who was the president of Qualcomm. She was the president of Deutsche Telekom. She's Russian. She got her PhD at 24. She moved to Germany. She's built her life. And she's a badass. And uh, for a couple of months when she was emailing me, I was afraid to open her emails because she was so direct. And she didn't give me smiley faces. She didn't give me exclamation points. She didn't say kind regards. She just said what you have to say. And she closed the email. And that taught me to be a better leader today because she didn't sit there and baby me. So my last question to close out the event, thank you Miles, it's been amazing. It's my first SW Tech event and I, I genuinely appreciate being here. Um, but what are some of the things that you learned to be better managers at your job? What did you do better? got to that and it is absolutely my fault I had to cut one question out which actually said what is the critical juncture in your life that made you get to where you are I actually took it out because I wanted to get more participation which is fantastic thank you for asking my question once again so who wants to go so a couple of pieces of feedback first of all I think that we're talking about the problems because they're real and we're here to support each other through that. And part of the authenticity is like not pretending that it's not happening. It is happening. Deal with it. You want directness? I'll give you directness. It's really important to be very direct. I mean, one of the things I found when I became a mom, I became such a better manager. Why? Because I have way less time. No bullshit. Cut to the chase. Here's what it is. Let's get this done. Let's move on. I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to ship. 
and, um, and in doing so with authenticity and integrity and respect and transparency and passion for what I'm doing, we ship. And when we ship, we see how the customers react and we, and we go back and we iterate on that. Um, so we're not, none of the questions were really about like, what do we do in our day jobs? We ship, um, we execute, we over deliver. Not because we're women, but because we're just really talented leaders, employees, marketers, uh, technologists, uh, what product people, whatever it is. It takes a whole bunch of skills to get together to ship and ship again and iterate on that. It's fantastic. But to talk about the fact that like it's hard being a single working mom. Like I'm sitting here texting with my kids, telling them, "Yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming." Um, and, um, and you know, you can please check the grammar before you go to sleep because like that's my responsibility too. Like read my text, that's what I'm doing. Um, because I have to do it all because that's what I signed up for. And it's my privilege to be able to do it. Having said that, I think that as a woman at the table, the one thing that I have always been from the beginning is me. I'm not trying to be like anyone but Tina. And sometimes I laugh, and sometimes I giggle, and sometimes I'm direct, and sometimes I'm short, and sometimes I'm long, but I'm me. And so if you could always be your authentic self and bring that passion and directness and authenticity to what you do, you will always know where your guiding star is because you don't have to be like anybody else. Be yourself. If the first question was, how am I on a public board? I don't look like any of the other board members. None of the boards do I look like anybody on that board, and my point of view is always mine. And I'm not trying to be like them. I'm trying to be like me. Because what I have to say really matters, and it adds to the conversation. And so the most important thing is to have the confidence to know that you can just be yourself. If you're a PhD, if you're a scientist, if you're a molecular biologist, bring that to the conversation, and don't be afraid to hide it. Um, and so, but I think that you have to understand that when you're dealing with all these other issues, it's important to have those conversations too and not to hide them or sweep them under the rug because they're real. And as leaders, we have to be willing to take those chances to talk about the stuff that might be uncomfortable or might be repetitive or might seem redundant because you can't say it enough because you can't watch change. Change happens over time. This little, this little snippet of conversation that you just gave to us, exactly what I wanted to hear. That yes, I've got kids, yes, I've got to take care of them. Be transparent about it, be at the table, tell them what you're bringing, and be you. This is the best advice that I think people in this room can get because you are authentic and you are transparent. And I think this is the advice that we need to be giving on these panels. Not not sitting and not complaining at any any disrespect to anybody on the table. My advisor as well is uh, a mother. And so she gave me a better manager when she had a kid as well. Um, because she had less time, just like she had less time to be perfect. So these real stories, I think, resonate more with us as we're growing up. I'm 25. I want to learn what I need to start thinking about as I become 35. And what I need to start preparing for. Maybe find the right partner who's going to be 50 50 with me, right? That I'm not trying to my relationship right now because of that. Where I feel like I'm doing more of the homework, the home chores, because I'm a woman, right? These are the conversations that I want. A more positive tone, but very direct and very clear. Do this, don't complain, do that, be yourself, bring your knowledge to the table, and never apologize for being yourself. Right, so would it be really inappropriate if I had to leave because they're really waiting for me? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You know, I you know, Tina applaud for what you just said. I think it's important to ask. We are also representing the companies that we belong to, and there is a certain accountability on the fact that people are leaving the workplace, and there are issues that we need to are real. And either we find ways to actually solve this, or embrace it and solve that, and, and this is why we're having these conversations. So I applaud you for actually sort of being authentic and showing us what, what it takes. Um, so thank you, thank you to this panel. You you have uh, you have really taken very long evening and, and turned it into a learning sort of opportunity for all of us. And some really really great messages around boards and diversity and and mobile and consumer and more you know investing as well. So I'm sure this is super useful. So just let's give us give them a round of applause.
your day-to-day -to, -day to come out and do something like this. So a round of applause for you guys for joining us. Thank you so much. This is really inspiring, really exciting, and we hope to see you again soon. Uh, thank you to all our panel members and to everybody who got put this together.